Hey everyone, good to be back with you. It's been about uh, two weeks, tomorrow will be exactly two weeks since the uh, election. And of course, again, we have a lot of people out there talking about the Electoral College and wanting to um, get rid of the Electoral College in favor of the popular vote. Now this is to be expected. Uh, it happens every time where we have a situation where someone wins the popular vote but loses the electoral vote. Now, surprisingly, this has only happened four times in our 240-year history. And regarding this particular election, we really don't know uh, yet who's won the popular vote because they're still counting votes. And if you want to go over to the FEC.gov website, Federal Election Commission website, you will see that they have a place there where you can put in your email address. And as soon as they have tabulated all the votes and have a final vote count for the popular vote, they will send you an email. I am on that list. So when it happens, I'll know. Now, the day after the election, with still many, many votes left to count, they were showing Hillary Clinton with about a tenth of 1% lead in the popular vote, approximately 106,000 votes. And this is typical of the four previous times uh, that we've had a person who won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College. It's generally never more than 1%. It's usually tenths of a percent. So it's still very, very close in the popular vote. And of course, the last time it happened in 2000, it was a very, very tiny majority for Al Gore. So this is all to be expected. But I'm always surprised when it happens because um, I think it's a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, and it tells me that a lot of people who are out there uh, pushing for this haven't really thought this through or haven't actually studied up a little bit on the issue. Now, I don't want to do a video to, uh, to go into all the nuts and bolts and the minutia of the electoral uh, system. Uh, you can watch other YouTube videos, documentaries, which do that. I want to do kind of a 10-minute video if I can and keep it pretty short. But <clears throat> essentially with an electoral vote, uh, unlike a popular vote where everyone in the country goes out and casts a vote and then you add up all the votes and the guy who got the most votes wins, with the electoral vote, essentially, in every state you're going and you're voting for electors. Electors are actually physical human beings. The number of electors is determined by the number of electoral votes in your state, and that number is determined by the population. Now, to understand a little bit more about um, why the electoral uh, college is a wonderful system and why we should never even think of abandoning it, and why it never will be uh, overturned. First of all, I believe it would re require a constitutional amendment that would require three quarters of the states to ratify it, and that will never happen, not in my lifetime. Um, so let's go back uh, just a little bit to the beginning of how this all got started. Uh, I want to point out a book to you. This is a book called The Miracle in Philadelphia by Catherine Drinker Bowen. And it's a very, very good book. It's one of those books you can read three or four times, and then you can, re you can refer to it many times in the future. It also has the Constitution in the back of the book, as well as the first ten amendments to the Constitution, um, the Bill of Rights. So, Miracle at Philadelphia. And it's a great book because uh, what it does is it gives us some insight into the Constitutional Convention, where the framers put together the Constitution and created our Federalist system. And... You have to keep in mind that this uh, convention kicked off in May of September eight, of se se 1787 and was completed finally in uh, September of se uh, 1787. So it took quite a while to, to put the Constitution together. They just didn't throw it together in a couple of weeks or anything. Um, and what we learn from this book, because James Madison, who was really the author of the Constitution, took very, very good notes and he noted all the arguments that were had and by who and what arguments they made. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of information about this. So uh, again, you can go as deep into this as you want to go. And this book really points out a lot of that. So anyway, in re reference to the Electoral College, it's really more of an issue of representation. You see, when the original framers came to the convention, 
you had at that time about 16 to 17 million people living in the country and we had 13 states functioning under the Articles of Confederation. And we had a lot of problems in the country and there was issues that needed to be dealt with and they could not be dealt with under the current Articles of Confederation. They needed to come up with something else that would allow them to get a handle on a lot of the problems that we had. But they ran into one major issue and that is that the representatives of the mostly the southern states which were very low in population uh, met there at the convention and found of course these representatives of the larger states in the north with large population centers such as New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, places like that, they realized that <clears throat> under a <clears throat> federalist system that the large states with large populations would practically dictate everything and they would likely uh, come up with policies and laws that would act in their interest and sometimes uh, against the interest of the smaller southern states. So the smaller states saw it as a situation where they were not going to have equitable and fair representation. So this was a major issue, if not the most major issue, uh, that the framers had to deal with when they put together the Constitution, is how do you assess equal and fair representation across the whole country? Our founders were also very, very smart guys. They had studied um, various forms of government. They were political scientists. And particularly in terms of democracies, they had looked at the various forms of democracies that had been in place and had been tried um, since the beginning of, I guess, modern mankind. And they found that there was 13 appreciable um, different designs or systems of democracy. And they found that every single one of them failed. So they determined that they didn't want to follow uh, any particular previous form of government that had been a failure. So, and actually that's where I think Benjamin Franklin came up with a line that, where he said that uh, a democracy is two wolves and a sheep <clears throat> deciding on what to have for dinner. And that's how they viewed democracies after their study of the various democracies uh, that were all failures. So they started looking at the republic, representative republics, and they found that they liked this system but the political theoreticians, the political scientists that they respected, the 15th, 16th century philosophers, had believed that you couldn't operate a republican form of government, a representative republic, on a large scale. They believed it could only be done on a small scale, on the size of a city or maybe a county. So our founding fathers decided that that's the direction they wanted to go in. But to, to get that done, they needed to solve um, the various deficiencies that existed at trying to create a republic on a large scale because our founders knew that the country would continue being populated and that someday there will be hundreds of millions of people here and they would continue to push westward they also knew that the major population centers would be along the coast they also knew that we had all these different cultures and religions and all these different uh, groups of people with their own jealousies and idiosyncrasies and that they would all have to be able to live together uh, without uh, fighting one another as they had seen in old Europe. So this is why they didn't like the democratic systems because that's usually what happened. And this is why they didn't go for the popular vote because they knew that in time if the large population centers were deciding uh, the laws and the policies of the country for everyone else that eventually those who were not being represented would rise up would cause insurrections revolutions and all sorts of things and you would have chaos murder death destruction and, and you wouldn't have a very successful government they understood that so they had to deal with the issue of representation now <clears throat> there were several things they did but the two major ones I'm going to focus on to um, to get the southern states to go along with the system of federalism and a constitutional republic. Because remember, they had 13 states, but to ratify the constitution, they needed nine states. So they were going to have to get four or five of these smaller states to buy into the system. So they had to make sure that they satisfied their issues with the inequities. Um, 
of competing large states against small states. So uh, one thing they did, which is obvious uh, to today, is that they decided that all states would be represented by two senators at the federal level. No matter how big or how small or how populated or how densely populated uh, or least populated your state was, you were going to get two senators with a voice for your state at the federal level. So it doesn't matter if you're California or if you're a small state with 55 electoral votes and lots of land mass or if you're Wyoming, a state with a lot of wide open uh, space and, and not a large population. Both states get two senators to represent them at the federal level. So this is one thing they did to make the smaller or less populous states feel more comfortable with um, signing on to the Constitution and ratifying it. But the next thing they had to deal with was the vote. And that's how they came up with the Electoral College. It's a, it's a really good system because it does take into consideration the larger states uh, should probably have uh, more say there's more people there okay so you can kind of make that argument but it doesn't totally uh, take out the equality and, and fairness to the smaller states and give them no voice it assesses a fair balance a fair mix across the board as close as you can come okay now you, it, it could be 100 percent perfect maybe it's only 90 percent perfect or 93 percent perfect but it's a far far better system than a, a simple popular vote because it does uh, allow the smaller or less populous states to feel that they have some equitable representation in the laws that govern our country. So uh, having two senators and, and, and creating the electoral uh, college system were the two main things that our founders did to satisfy the questions that the smaller states had about representation. In over 240 years, it has stood the test of time and and has really done a very good job. I mean, it's I don't I don't know where you can find that much fault with it. Always, when you have an election where someone wins one or two percent more of the popular vote but loses the electoral college, you're always going to have these you know this pop up. We saw it back in 2000. But like I said, we really don't know who won the popular vote yet. Um, it was Hillary had a one tenth of one percent lead the day after the election, but there's many votes left to be counted, and it's quite possible that Donald Trump could win the popular vote. It'll probably be one or two tenths of a percent, or maybe Hillary will hold on to it, but it'll still be one or two, probably no more than three tenths of a percent. It's very tight, but it doesn't matter because the election's over. We do have the Electoral College system, and it proved to be effective once again. Now, could you imagine if we didn't have the Electoral College and we had a popular vote? Uh, uh, not even to mention the point I just mentioned about how the country would evolve into chaos, but can you imagine what the election would look like? You literally would have uh, literally seven to ten states where the uh, two political parties would go to get votes. They wouldn't even bother campaigning in Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Wyoming, uh, Vermont, Maine. They wouldn't even bother going to these places because the entire election would be about winning the popular vote, which meant that you would spend all of your time in the seven to ten uh, most most populous states because that's where all the votes were that's where the game would be won or lost so that's where both political parties would spend all their time so people in the other 40 states would never see a political ad hardly or certainly a politician coming into their state to campaign because the whole game would come down to the large population centers and and so what cities are those well the, the largest cities in the United States are, of course, New York is the largest, uh, Los Angeles is the second largest, Chicago is the third largest, I believe Miami, and then I think Dallas, um, Houston, Philadelphia, and there's a couple more. But there's basically, those are the big cities, and that's where all the campaigning would be done, that's where all the money would be spent, and what that means is in order to get those votes, those politicians would have to cater to those population centers these big cities. And so the issues of the people living in the middle of the country would never even uh, would never even hardly be considered because they wouldn't get you any votes. You would have to, politicians in both parties would have to cater to the desires of those in the big cities and on the coasts 
and we know how those people usually vote. Now, here's another argument that I kind of hear uh, that, that's, that's not true, is a lot of people say, well, you know, why in our system, the Electoral College, Ohio and Florida always decide it. Well, that, that's not true. That's only for people who are just taking a look at five or ten years, but our country is 240 years old, and it's going to continue on and on and on. Over the long term, it, it's really not true. And in fact, in this last election, Donald Trump could have lost Ohio or Florida and still won because he won in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and uh, in Iowa, and some other places where uh, Democrats thought that they were in play or even would win the state. So uh, Florida didn't necessarily decide this election. It would have been much closer had Clinton won Florida, but she still would have lost. Or Ohio, she still would have lost. So Ohio and Florida don't really determine the election. <clears throat> now, another thing is that if you look at the course of our long history, um, states do not stay the same color. Uh, they're constantly changing. Every 20 to 30 years, sometimes uh, quicker than that, they flip from one to another. For instance, when I was a kid, California was a solid red state. Nixon carried California once for sure. He maybe carried it twice. Reagan definitely carried California twice. It was a red state when I was a kid. Texas was a blue state when I was a kid. Can you imagine that? Yes, that's right. California used to be a red state and Texas used to be a blue state all in my lifetime. And purple states change and red states change and blue states change. So it's always shifting and changing with, with, with as the parties shift and change. You know, when the Democratic Party was known as the party of the working man, the labor unions, and that type of thing, uh, they did better in the, in, in the Rust Belt. But as we saw in this most recent election, Donald Trump was looked at by a lot of people in the working class, blue collar workers, union workers, people in the Rust Belt, in the South, as being someone who, uh, whose policies they believed would, would help them more. Uh, Hillary Clinton really didn't uh, offer the policies to those groups of people that they thought would benefit them, and that's why she lost those areas. So it's possible that we could be seeing the turning of several of these former blue states into red states. It's very, very possible. And you could see Colorado go, you know, strong blue. You could see, you know, uh, you know Arizona or one of these other states that typically like to vote Republican. You could see them go blue. So, you know, the, the, the political winds are always shifting. Uh, it's always in a state of flux. So these are just some of the myths that are out there. Um, and people who who like to jump on this bandwagon, which I think is what is happening. A couple prominent people may stand up and make a case for getting rid of the Electoral College. All of a sudden it's on Twitter, and all of a sudden zillions of people who've never studied the issue at all decide to jump on a bandwagon because it's popular or whatever, because uh, they're butthurt because their side lost. But anyone who takes a realistic view uh, at the Electoral College versus the popular vote and actually thinks about it for, for just a few minutes will come to the conclusion that the Electoral College is, is, is a very good system. It may not be a perfect system, but it's far better than the popular vote. You do not want a popular vote. You are looking at uh, tremendous uh, problems uh, uh, that would come as a result of having a popular vote. And it, it just wouldn't work. And like I said, it'll never happen, uh, not anytime soon, because the you would need three quarters of the states to ratify that and many of these states would be small states who would be harming their state, their party, their voting district, their donors, and themselves. Okay, so th th they're not going to do that. So that's not going to happen. So it's pretty much a moot point. But I did just want to do a quick video on, on this and uh, just try to throw a little bit of common sense, reason, and sanity into the equation because it's, uh, it's lacking in a lot of ways. So anyway, if, uh, if you're really into this sort of stuff, I highly recommend pick up a copy of The Miracle of Philadelphia. Uh, it's a great book, and uh, or you can just kind of research things online, and you'll be surprised at uh, how much you can learn uh, about the arguments that were made and who made those arguments and, and that type of thing, and you'll see that James Madison was a very good note taker. <laughs> okay, so anyway, that's about it uh, for, this, for this video. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. If you like the video, uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, share with your friends, subscribe to my uh, channel, um, and uh, 
comments. I always love comments, so if you want to make some comments, go ahead and do that. I do read them. Uh, at this point, I'm small enough that I, I can read all the comments I get. So uh, go ahead and make those comments, and I uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again. Thanks, everyone. See ya.